Okay, kurze Frage. Spricht hier jemand kein Englisch? Alles klar. Okay, then I'd like to, to give this talk in English. So, let's just let the last people settle and then we we'll start. Okay, welcome. My name is Chatty and I will talk about the Facebook of financial transactions, user tracking on the Bitcoin blockchain. Disclaimer, this is a hobby project. I'm only doing, I have only done this a little bit in my free time, read a little bit on that. Uh, if you bet any money on what I say here, then, and if you lose that, then don't blame me. If you gain a lot of money because of things I tell you, you owe me a beer. Furthermore, Bitcoin, that's what we want to talk about today. Um, who here owns Bitcoins? Some people do, okay. Bitcoin, this new nice cryptocurrency. Who here has taken a deeper look onto the internals how, of how Bitcoin works? Some people have, okay. But we'll still just go a little bit over it, how, how the Bitcoin system works, because that's what, we, what we'll deal with no, uh, now. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a system that works based on transactions. So. I have a Bitcoin and I want to transfer it to someone and for that I create a transaction transferring my Bitcoin to someone else's address. Bitcoin is basically all, over, uh, all about transactions. There is no balance nowhere. We only have the, the set of transactions which form the blockchain and from that we can conclude which, thing, which transactions or which Bitcoins I can spend and which not. The way this works is this, this here is a transaction. The transaction consists of a hash that comes from here where we don't know anything. There is the public key of owner number one and we have owner number zero's signature. What that, does that mean? Well, let's take a look into this block here. Um, owner two shall receive an uh, a Bitcoin. And I can, we can just uh, assume that this is a, um, equivalent to the Bitcoin address of owner number two, because a Bitcoin address is nothing else than the hash of a certain public key. So if we have an address, the address is only a hash of the public key, then we do have a corresponding private key to that public key. And how now a transaction works is someone got a Bitcoin, and this, this someone wants now to to put it to some, to give it to someone else. So this someone, owner number one, who got a, or got a Bitcoin here, just says, I want to have this transaction, which has a certain hash to identify this transaction. I want to give that transaction output, that the things I received there to owner number two. I specify his address or his public key. And to prove that I am allowed to spend this Bitcoin, I put my signature down there, which with my private key that corresponds to the public key that received this transaction in the first place. And then we have this transaction. This transaction is now spent. I cannot spend it anymore if I'm the one owning that before. And now this is like the, um, the last unspent transaction. And this can then again be issued to owner number three by refer referencing um, the address, the hash of the trans transaction where it shall come from, and putting the signature of the person owning this transaction, um, attaching that to this transaction. Now, this thing is called a blockchain. What is a blockchain? A blockchain is a chain of blocks. Yeah. And what we have here is we have the block, we have like some previous hash, the previous hash is actually the hash of the block before, and the block includes some transactions in there. And because this, the, the following block includes the hash of the previous block, we have now a defined, a cryptogra cryptographically defined chain uh, constituting like our flow of money, flow of Bitcoins, so to say. And we say a transaction is valid when it is somewhere in the blockchain and ideally we have blocks afterwards, so it's somewhere in the chain. This now constitute our, constitutes our blockchain. 
And what is a transaction? A little bit more visual. A transaction is we have said we have some other transactions output, which I can spend in a transaction to an address with a certain amount. So I can say, I want to issue a transaction. I have, this, I have received this output and this output, and probably this output as well. And I want to issue them to different persons, to like that address, to that degree, like I, want, I have got one Bitcoin here, one Bitcoin here, one Bitcoin here. I want to issue that to this address with like half a Bitcoin, this address with like 1.5 Bitcoin, and this address shall receive one, bit, one Bitcoin. This is how transaction is structured. We additionally have a timestamp, which corresponds to the block the transaction is included in. So we can approximately say where the transaction happened in time, if it's like a couple of years ago or if, it's, if it is just recent. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Yes, there is a question. Uh, no, the blockchain is just a single chain of transactions. There is some chalk here. Um, we have like a block, and we have like a block, and we have like a block. Um, what of course can happen is that um, there might be another block branching from here, which is technically possible, of course. This is technically possible because it can simply say, I take the hash of this block and then add it uh, and then reference that here and constitute another, constitute another blockchain here. But by definition, the longest chain wins. So the longest chain is always the valid one. And this is like this one chain that goes for. So this, this here is the valid chain. This one here gets discarded. So it's, it's really just one long chain. Yes? Uh, the transactions in the branch are simply not valid. That is why you are asked when you do a Bitcoin transaction, you should wait like that there, <clears throat> or you can assume your transaction to be safe or safely made once there are like, I think the th rule of thumb is like six blocks afterwards. Because once you have like six blocks afterwards, it is unlikely that another, that another chain, the branching chain, will be the winning chain and you can be more or less sure that uh, you are in the canonical chain, so to say. That was another question? Okay. All right. Yes, where did I stop? Okay, this is a transaction. I can specify an arbitrary number of, in uh, of like inputs. These are the inputs outputs from other transactions or references to other transactions I put into my transaction, and I can specify an arbitrary amount of outputs to which I want to issue a certain number of bitcoins. This in the end, <coughs> pardon me, this in the end um, gets us to a graph, a graph where we can see that a bitcoin flew, uh, floats or from, from one person to the next person to the next person to the next person. And there we have connections. It's like, it's like a network, it's a directed graph. This is just a symbolic image, but it's quite nice. So, um, And we can see that we, we, have issue, we have things like somewhere we have like very dense clusters and somewhere we have like very sparse things. Um, but overall, with um, just having the inputs and the outputs, we can see such a network. And as the blockchain is a public record, we can also really track that graph down. The thing how Bitcoin actually manages to get, a, get around without a central authority is by publishing this record. So like by publishing this uh, this network of transactions. So, these are some Bitcoin addresses. Someone notices them. Okay, these are the three addresses that were used uh, for WannaCrypt, which hit like 72 countries, shut down uh, a decent number of British hospitals and some other mayhem. And we can just take these addresses as the blockchain is a cryptographic a cryptographically sound public record, we can 
go into the blockchain and find those addresses and see how many people have paid the ransom that was to be paid in, uh, in Bitcoin to the ransomware writers. Any guesses how many people paid? Not many, say a number, 10,000, okay? Hmm? 200, any other votes? This was actually very interesting. I went through the blockchain and I found exactly 351 transactions to those addresses. Um, that was the point where I was, um, actually very confused where I did my, maybe you know that when you sit in front of your code and you get a result and you think um, that doesn't sound very likely and then you search your error and then finally you come to the conclusion there is no error there are really just 351 persons over the entire world that paid the Bitcoin ransoms for WannaCrypt. It still made them a decent amount of 52 Bitcoins which, especially to the current, uh, with the current exchange rates, is not that little. And as you can imagine, those Bitcoins have left those wallets by now. Someone transferred them somewhere. So, I said I can specify an arbitrary number of inputs and an arbitrary number of outputs in those transactions. We see the number of inputs here, and we see the number of outputs here. And I just went over all the transactions I can find. And we see it clusters at low numbers of both and we have a very decent um, number going up here. It actually, this is just cut it at 1,000 and 1,000, but it goes up, here it goes up like 20,000, and here it goes up like also like something like 20,000, um, which is really a lot. And we can, s this, this characterizes us how Bitcoin is used in that regard. For example, we have a small number of inputs and a large number of outputs, those types of transactions can correspond to mining pool payouts. Mining pools are usually organized. A lot of people are throwing their computational power into one pool. They all compute, and if one of them finds a Bitcoin, then this Bitcoin is distributed to everyone in the pool. And these are, we just, we put in a little amount. We put just in this found Bitcoin, and we distribute it to a lot of people in the pool. This is one typical example, um, what could occur uh, in, in that realm here. Another thing that could happen um, over here, for example, is we have a lot of number, uh, we have a lot of inputs, but very few outputs. This looks more like aggregating, uh, like aggregating Bitcoins together. So I received a lot of very small amounts and I want to have the hassle with dealing with them all, so I just aggregate them together. What we also see is uh, well, here it is very dense. We'll take uh, a look at that in a minute. And um, some interesting patterns emerge here. This is around 500 uh, outputs constantly and a variable number of inputs. This is, this is a very interesting pattern. We see something similar here as well. Um, I have a suspicion what that might be, but I, I don't know. But we will get to that as well in a minute. So, um, we see here it is very dense, so we don't, basically don't see anything. So let's just cut out the 300 by 300 uh, square here and just create a histogram. This is a logarithmic histogram, so this here is in fact 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, and here we are at uh, 10 to the power of 8. And we see that the transactions are heavily clustering at transactions that, are, that have a very small number of inputs and a very small number of outputs, which is reasonable, which I would suspect is the usual payment behavior of someone, um, just I want to pay someone out there. This is also very beneficial for our user tracking because that allows, um, because that is really, um, we can really trace that you, for example, paid this, this certain address and the other person paid this certain address, so we really have a nice flow of money from one identity to the next. Whereas if it would, have, would be more like in here, then we, would, we could not safely say who is paying whom here, but um, there might be some, some uncertainty there. But as it is clustering right here, that makes this very attractive. Okay, so 
first of all, we have to think about clustering addresses right now. What does that mean? Well, technically, you could generate a new Bitcoin address for each purchase, for each transaction you made. Actually, in the original paper of Satoshi Nakamoto, this is encouraged to do. And it, uh, it, it is a challenge when we want to track down actual real people, because uh, I could have like 100 Bitcoin addresses, and how do you attribute those all to me? Because you cannot really say that all of these addresses belong to me, because some are doing those transactions, some are doing those transactions, right? And if we could cluster those addresses together, this would allow us to really see the, the patterns uh, emerging and provide a better leverage to to identify certain uses. For example, if I have someone interacting with you, for example, and we just ship around bitcoins, and I have another address which I do some illegal stuff with, and those could be clustered, and yours is identified, then we're very fast um, to identify me as the potential person to do this, uh, this illegal activity. So what can we do to cluster addresses? The first approach we can use, all of those are heuristics. Some of them are more reliable than others, but um, this one is pretty solid. All inputs to a transaction belong to the same user. As a consequence, all addresses and keys related to these transactions belong to the same user as well. We remember the transaction diagram. When I do a transact, when I want to to, to use a transaction as an input, I have to provide a signature. To provide this signature, I need to know the private key of, of that address. If I now feed in like three, uh, three inputs, I need to know, I need to specify those three signatures, and I need to know all the private keys belonging to those transactions, or to those transaction outputs to be precise. So it is likely to say that if I can do this, I know all the three public keys, and I think it is pretty safe to say that a, public key, uh, a private key is nothing you give away easily. So this is a very solid measure to say uh, to, to cluster addresses. There is research on that. For example, the authors um, of the paper "A Fistful of Bitcoin: User Tracking um, A Fistful of Bitcoin Characterizing." Characterizing Payments Among when Men with No Names by Sarah Michael John and, their co and her colleagues. They did exactly that analysis and they were able to reduce the number of identities in the blockchain by a factor of uh, two. They could halve the number of identities in, this, in the blockchain by just clustering address, uh, addresses by this approach. Okay. Change addresses. Change addresses are the second approach that is used in the literature. This one is a little bit less robust, but it is also uh, it is also quite a common one. And depending on what you want to do with the tracking, this is also one that is uh, that might provide very uh, to be very efficient. We remember this transaction, and um, to speak about change addresses, we first have to define what is a change address. In Bitcoin, you cannot, we, we can only specify outputs as an input. But if I like have an input that is 10 Bitcoins and I want to pay you one Bitcoin, I don't want to pay you 10 Bitcoins, especially not at the current exchange rates. So how do we solve this? We cannot spend half transactions. We can either spend a transaction or we don't. So what we do to solve this is we, I send you one Bitcoin as one output and the other output just uh, is I, I just pay myself the other nine bitcoins. Those, uh, those addresses that I use to pay myself are called change addresses because that's what I get back for change. And those addresses are usually generated. So that your bitcoin client will just generate a new random address and use that as a change address. Some clients actually use your own address as the change address and send the change directly back to you, but approximately two-thirds of, uh, of the Bitcoin clients out there apparently uh, use a new generated address, which makes sense if you think about it when we think that we want to use a different address for each transaction to reduce the opportunity of tracking. So one-third of those addresses go directly back to us, so that's fine, and the other 
two-thirds of the change addresses are usually not used that often. Basically, you generate the new address, you pay some, some money to that, and then you just redeem it somewhere, but you d don't use it any further. So the approach for change addresses says if an address occurs only once in the blockchain, it is likely to be a change address and belongs to the same user as the inputs. This, um, utilizing this, we have, I also have data for that by Mr. Michael John here. This again cuts down the number of addresses or the number of identities by a factor of two thirds. So we have halved the number of uh, potential identities, potential persons in the blockchain by a factor of two um, with the first approach and um, after applying our second approach here, we're down to one-third of what remained from that, which is very, a pretty solid measure. The problem of this is, of course, if I only, uh, if I only pay someone who um, only used this address once or was, I just paid someone, I paid some ransomware and they never redeemed it, this might be a false positive to be identified, so this approach is not too robust. But if you try to find someone in the blockchain, you can use this as well. Maybe you get some false leads and they prove to be a dead end, but maybe they might be a trace. Okay, address reusage. We have spoken about the encouragement of using addresses just once. I have just counted how much addresses were used. And what we see here is the number of usages and the number of addresses that were reused that often. So like um, approximately 150 addresses are used 500 times, um, like 50 addresses are re reduced like uh, 750 times, and quite a lot of addresses are reused at least like 250 50 times. And if addresses are reused, that often, and also up to a 500 here, this gives us a pattern in the, in the graph. If you remember the, uh, the graph image, this gives us a pattern how people spend their Bitcoins and how this identity behaves by spending Bitcoins. For example, if I pay um, to netspolitik.org, this is traceable and um, people can see that I paid something to netspolitik.org. If you do the same that WikiLeaks did, WikiLeaks did, um, um, a campaign to raise some money and you could donate by Bitcoin and they had given everyone the same Bitcoin address. So I could easily see who in the blockchain is paying to WikiLeaks. And if I have enough of those data points, I might be able to trace someone down to a certain identity, possibly. So the interesting thing is that one. Apparently, some addresses have been uh, this, uh, the number of like 1,200 usages is unexpectedly popular. I don't have any clue what's going on here. I really don't. But it looked very interesting. Um, what, what about this here, the slope here? It goes up like some million reusages, uh, it's like some million addresses that are reused quite a small number of times. Okay, now we have spoken a lot about how to reduce our search space, how to cluster addresses, how to identify which Bitcoin addresses belong to the same person. And we might, um, we might be able to identify people in the blockchain, but we still don't have a name. What we now would like to do is getting names. So how do we get names? First approach is ask Google. I just took the 1,105 top payment receivers and just throw them at Google and looked how many search results I would get. And actually, quite a lot. Like, this is only the first page, which uh, provides 10 hits. And a lot of those addresses are found very popularly on, on the web, which is not that surprising because they are the top 100, uh, 1,105 payment receivers. So this might be like large institutions like, for example, WikiLeaks, maybe NetPolitik.org, and those are publicly on the web, and I can identify them uh, quite easily. Uh, but I have, ran, uh, I have let um, my script uh, 
trace down some more addresses, and it seems that quite a number is uh, to, be uh, to be found on the web. I have not yet ran it for the full number of addresses because that have been quite many and I simply didn't have the time for that analysis up to very now. But this is the one, this is the first very simple approach of identifying addresses. The other one is large exchange, ex exchange services like, for example, Bitcoin.de, Mt. Gox, some exchanges, BitPay. They have Bitcoin addresses too. And what I can do is I can simply exchange some money for some Bitcoin with those services. And if I have done this, I can just generate a new address for that, and I just can see uh, and just tell them, I have this address, you have, uh, I have $10, just give me the amount of Bitcoins to this address. And then I can see from which transaction they will send me that address, and then I have an address that belongs to them that belongs to those exchanges, and those exchanges are really large clusters. So if the clustering already provided me with a clustering there, and now I have actually gotten money from them, I can immediately say, okay, this cluster is, for example, Mt. Gox, this cluster is Bitcoin DE, this cluster is whatever else. And then, in the end, it comes down to only filling enough gaps in the graph to see that if someone is in the graph and is surrounded by known identities, I can easily get to their identity, or at least um, get close to them. The other approach, not just saying I know all of the people around you, but actually getting the names of someone is, might also be quite easy. I can just go to the phone and call, for example, let's call them Bitcoin DE and say, hello, my name is enforcement, uh, law enforcement. I would like to have some name for some certain Bitcoin address you used to pay money to. And then Bitcoin DE will say, oh yes, just tell me where to send the information. We don't need a warrant. We just hand over your information. And this is the point where, in the end, the, the pseudonymity of Bitcoin ends because somewhere you have the interfaces to the real world. Somewhere you want to exchange money for Bitcoin. And those payment providers, they do have the information because they receive money from you and they shall give you Bitcoins and you have to trust them. And if, like Bitcoin DE, they just hand over your customer data, then it is very easy to trace you down. Especially if you're doing illegal activity because then the people who want to trace you down are law enforcement and people alike. Okay, so, uh, the, when, and then basically the same, the same thing uh, as you have here is that in the end, every like currency currently is to be able to be traced down like uh, the, uh, the conventional money we have. So, we have the, uh, we have the, the cluster and if I, I don't, m I must not be known from my personal Bitcoin activities, but if my usage patterns are in a way that all the people around me are identified, or at least someone around me is identified, then it's very easy to identify myself. Uh, myself. Some story time. I have told you that we can just go over the Bitcoin blockchain and just take a look what happens there. We can do that some more. Well, for, for example, we can do this with, with this address. Anyone knows this address? This is one of Silk Road's addresses. And you can trace this address on the Bitcoin blockchain. And you will see that in late 2012, this address received in several charges of some thousand Bitcoins, received like 60,000 and something Bitcoins which is quite a, num quite a number of fortune. And we also have seen that if we identify enough payment providers, if we identify enough people around you, we can just trace those Bitcoins through the network. And in fact, this is also something um, Sarah Michael, John and her colleague, uh, colleagues did, and they were able to trace down the 60,000 Bitcoins that were shortly after withdrawn from that account they would trace them down and they would uh, see a very interesting pattern. Those 60,000 Bitcoins would be 
would, would go through the network over several entities. They would just split and merge back together, and at some point they would just peel off like, like an onion. Some of them, uh, the, the main cache stream would just continue to flow, and some of them would be branched, and like, like a tree. And in the end, most of these branchings, they could trace down to those payment providers where these bitcoins might actually be exchanged for money. So if you want to wash your money, might not use Bitcoin. Unfortunately, as far as I know, it, now it depends on if the payment provider gives out the information who withdraw the, the Bitcoins. And um, from what I have found, this was apparently either not um, further investigated or those exchanges that, that were involved there did not hand out customer customer data that easily. Uh, tracing thefts, we can do that the, th the same thing basically with uh, tracing thefts and there, is, there are some interesting thefts like you have some digital gambling casino-like thingy and there is a hacker that thinks, oh, there is a lot of money to be gained. I just break in there and I get some bitcoins out of there. This happened, for example, like gambling casinos. There is um, the institution at my Bitcoin, Linode, Bitcoin, Bitonica, Bitfloor, all of those services have had security breaches and Bitcoins were taken out of them. And we have the same pattern. Things are flowing through the Bitcoin network. They would peel off to make it harder to trace down the actual endings. But in the end, most of the money that were taken from, from these services, and we're speaking about like up to the amount of 40,000 Bitcoins here, all of these Bitcoins ended up at some point uh, in major Bit or almost of them ended in some major exchanges. So in the end, it always comes down to where, the, where things leave the Bitcoin network. And if you get those points, then you can trace back all the payments, usually to the person that initiated them. Okay, we have spoken about a lot about how to track Bitcoins, which is especially easy if you have like smaller uh, if you have transactions with small outputs and small inputs, input numbers. But now the question is, maybe we're going to use Bitcoin and maybe we want to keep some of our anonymity. Um, what can we do about it? Are there possibilities that uh, we can do? And the answer is, there actually are some. Let's start simple. As I already mentioned, as an additional firewall, a new key pair should be used for each transaction, recommended by the original paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, the um, father of Bitcoin, in his paper about the system. So if you do something with Bitcoin, use a different address for each transaction. This is not this this makes it not so much harder to track you, but at least it it blows some it blows some noise onto the onto the issue and makes it a little bit more complicated. If you want some more solid anonymity, there is an operation that's called coin join that some people do. Imagine we have Alice and we have Bob and both are specifying an input and both of them want to pay someone. And what they do is they just join for a transaction and Alice gives in one transaction, Bob gives in the other and then this, this transaction end up, ends up with one, uh, one output to the address Alice wants to pay, with the amount Alice wants to pay, and one address and amount of Bob's liking. That way we have, the, we have, uh, we have basically undermined the assumption number one. If we have the same inputs, then we would be the same person because that would falsely identify Alice and Bob belonging to the same person. However, this, this is an option. It is not very likely to happen because of this private key issue I mentioned before. But if you want to regain anonymity, uh, if you want to keep some of your anonymity in the Bitcoin network, then this is one of your options. Yes? That is a very good point. Now we come to the second, pr the, the problem of this. If Alice wants to spend like 10 Bitcoins because she wants to pay 
the ransom for some very advanced um, descendant of WannaCrypt or something, and Bob just wants to pay his coffee with like 0 0.01 bitcoins, which would be a, which would still be a damn expensive coffee, then we would we could simply see which amount would belong to Alice, which amount would belong to Bob. That is very true. This is the other. Um, this is the problem with the, with these coin join transactions. You have to be on a similar level. But we can do coin join on steroids, which is called mixing. And with a coin join transaction, we are somewhere here. But we could, in principle, do the same thing over here. Mixing does the same thing. We feed in this time not just two, but we feed in quite a lot of inputs, and we get out quite a lot of outputs. And that way, the idea of that is to, this is, this is like money washing, we want to decouple the input identity from the output identity. So you're very advised to not use your input address as an output address, otherwise this would, would be very futile. But in principle, this, this could be done. Uh, the issue with the private keys increases, so you would have to hand that over to kind of a service that you trust, but possible it is. Those mixing, uh, um, those mixing services do have actual countermeasures for the thing you mentioned, because we can also do output tracing. We could also, um, coming back to the change address, we could also use that for identifying change addresses, because if I uh, see an amount that is smaller than all of than any of my input amounts, then this will be the amount I would get uh, get back to ch uh, as a change, because otherwise I could have just dropped one of the uh, of the inputs. So to to avoid all of that, those mixing transactions usually require each and every participant to put in the same amount of bitcoins. So. Each and every one should uh, put in like one Bitcoin and each of uh, every transaction does get out approximately one Bitcoin. And usually those transactions do not look like this. They also are splitted into like sub-transactions and you have a network, a, a net of those transactions and some of the inputs are handed out as outputs quite early and other ones would just stream a little longer in the mixing process and would branch later to further to further like, avoid detection. This is why you actually don't have, don't have so, many, so many transactions in this area, but probably the, the mixings are more, this, this might be coin mixing. And the, the additional, to, to, to obfuscate it even more, there is the thing called transaction fees. We have said we have the inputs and we have the outputs and usually how you get money in the Bitcoin system or how you create money in the Bitcoin system is by mining Bitcoins. The other way how you could make money in the Bitcoin system is by collecting Bitcoin transaction fees. And Bitcoin transaction fees are nothing else than I just sum over my outputs, I sum over my inputs, and the difference belongs to the person including my transaction into his block. And this is actually the incentive I, the, the miners have to include my transaction to the block because I pay them a certain fee. And those mixing services also generate a random fee to further decouple the inputs from the outputs and um, make it harder to trace amounts to, uh, to avoid, to avoid this, this detection. But still, mixing makes it harder but doesn't make it impossible. And especially depending on the crime you did, it might still be interesting for law enforcement agencies to track you down and in doubt track every, each and every one of them down who got some bitcoins out of here. Okay, how we are in time? Ah, I still have some time left. Okay. So, input-output ratios. Um, I mentioned that we might come to this, this thing here. This could be, I could imagine that this here is a mixing uh, so is, is such a Bitcoin mixing. For example, we have, the, uh, we have the number of outputs here, and it has a constant number of outputs, and it just takes a varying number of inputs, mixes them, and distributes them around somehow. So I could imagine that this, this here is some kind of mixing, but I don't know for sure. 
Okay. Some recap. Uh, what have we learned today? Hopefully, we have, you have learned something. And what we have seen here, bitcoins are insanely traceable. Uh, even to the point, uh, there is one other interesting story when, they, when the FBI closed down the, the Silk Road marketplace, then they also arrested Dread Pirate Roberts, who was, which is the pseudonym of the person operating that marketplace, and they seized, the, uh, they seized his, uh, the, his computer with his wallet on there, where he had uh, 144,000 bitcoins worth 28 million dollars, and they transferred that onto an account belonging to the FBI, and they did 446 transactions, and each of the 445 first transactions would exactly transfer 324 bitcoins, which and 324 is exactly uh, corresponding to, um, to taking an old phone and typing FBI on that, phone's, on that phone's keyboard. Which is, you have to give the guys that, they have some humor. Okay, so we have seen bitcoins are insanely traceable, and there is little you can do about it. We have, you should use a lot of addresses to avoid this, but we still have opportunities to cluster those. So, if you want to have really anonymous money, you might actually be better off with a conventional payment system, which is not publicly recorded, but is somewhere in the, in, the, in the swamp of the financial system, much harder to trace. Yes, but if you're law enforcement, uh, if you're someone from law enforcement, I don't know if someone from law, from law enforcement is here, then you will have a very nice time with Bitcoin if criminals are using Bitcoin for their payments. That's about what I wanted to, uh, to show you. Are there any questions? There are questions. Uh, my code, my analysis code. Um, no, my code is not on GitHub yet. I could, I could throw this, the analysis scripts on, uh, onto GitHub. Uh, there is one little problem about my analysis scripts. Um, they take up like 351 gigabytes of memory, which is maybe not... Um, I, I don't know if you have such a machine. I was lucky enough to have such a machine at hand, which proved to be very fortunate for that purpose. Um, there is the page blockchain.info, which can be used to, which is a Bitcoin blockchain explorer, which can basically do this uh, similar thing that, that I did. Um, the analysis library I used for my analysis is written by the same guys operating that service. So for smaller analysis, this might, might already be uh, what you're looking for. I nevertheless could uh, see if I could publish my, my analysis scripts if you're interested. Yes. That is interesting. Hmm. That is a very interesting remark for the record. Um, there are apparently uh, ATM cash machines in Austria that allow you to locally withdraw money or put money into, into the Bitcoin system without identifying yourself in, uh, to, to like an exchange service like Bitcoin.de or a bank or someone else, which might actually give you back some anonymity uh, in that regard. or at least reduce your traceability a little bit.
tools to visualize this. Um, like the graph structure of, uh, of, the, of the Bitcoin network. Yeah, I have linked some of the papers here. Um, this one is very interesting. This is the basic paper. Um, Ms. Michael John and her colleagues, they had some visualizations. Uh, however, unfortunately, they only operated on uh, data leading up to 2013. Uh, but they have some nice visualizations. I am sure there are other visualizations, but I'm not aware where to find them right now. I would have to, to look uh, that up as well. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, question for the record. Um, there we mentioned there are different other cryptocurrencies that apparently try to improve the anonymity, anonymity aspect of, uh, of like those blockchain technologies. Uh, I have not looked into them, so I cannot give, um, so I cannot really say much to them. But in the end, it of course ends up that you have some public record. It would be very interesting if they try, if they, if they solve the anonymity issue somewhere else, uh, uh, somehow, somehow differently. Ah, so they, they are introducing a lot more cryptography or cryptographical cryptography proofs to, to try to ensure better shuffling. That would be very interesting. They claim it. Uh, can you repeat the names for the record? Monero was the one and the other one was? Zetnash, okay. If someone on the record wants to take a look into those, um, now you have the names. Further questions? Okay, I shall come to an end. Then uh, if there are any questions left, I'm still on the, on the conference and thank you very much for your attention.